Life of the Tribals under the British Raj. This video is brought to you by An Academy in association with GyanCentral.com. So let me tell you a story about a man named Birsa. He was a tribal man. In the year 1895, he was seen roaming the forests and villages of Chota Nagpur in Bihar. People said he had miraculous powers. Birsa himself claimed that God had appointed him to save his people from trouble, free them from the slavery of the Dikus or the outsiders. Now soon thousands began to follow Birsa. His followers not only included that of his tribe, which was the family of Munda as a tribal group that lived in Chota Nagpur, but his followers also included the tribals of the entire region. Now, all of them, in different ways, were unhappy with the changes they were experiencing and the problems they were facing under the British rule. Their familiar ways of life seemed to be disappearing and their livelihoods were under threat and their religion also appeared to be in danger. So, what were these problems Birsa set out to resolve? Who were these outsiders being referred to as Dikus? And how did they enslave the people of the region? What was happening to the tribal people under the British? Let us take a look. Now we know that essentially a Hindu society in those times was a rigid caste based society. Now most tribes had customs and rituals that were very different from those laid out by the Brahmanas. Now these societies did not have sharp social di divisions. These social divisions were a characteristic of caste societies but the tribals differed from this. And all those who belonged to the same tribe thought of themselves as to belonging to the same kinship. However, this did not mean that there were no social and economic differences between the tribes. The tribals mostly lived separated from the common uh, cities, places, towns where people lived. They preferred the forests, the natural places. So how did these tribal groups live? How did they survive? The truth is, they were engaged in a variety of activities, starting with some of them being Joom cultivators. Joom cultivation was also known as shifting cultivation. Now this was done mostly in small patches of land, like forests. The cultivators then cut the treetops to allow sunlight to reach the ground. Next, they burnt all the vegetation of land to clear it for cultivation. They spread the ash they obtained after firing. Now this ash contained something known as potash which was used to fertilize the soil. Now to cut the trees, these cultivators used the axe and to scratch the soil in order to prepare it for cultivation, they used the hoe. Now instead of uh, plowing the land and sowing the seeds, they broadcast the seeds that is, scattered the seeds on the field. Now once the crop was ready and harvested, they moved to another field. So the field that had been cultivated once was left fallow for several years. If you look at this picture clearly, this is an example of Joom cultivation of a land, a forest land being cleared so that the cultivators can grow crops here. A part of the forest has been burnt and that part has been utilized to cultivate crops. One more thing to notice is that the cultivators usually build their houses near the cultivation area. So whatever land they cleared, they build their houses near that. Now the second method of survival was that some of them were hunters and gatherers. In many regions, the tribal groups lived by hunting animals and gathering forest products. Now they saw the forest as an essential for their survival. Now the Khonts were such a community living in the forests of Orissa. This is the picture of a woman from the Kutia Khond tribal group of Orissa. Now this tribe regularly went out on collective hunts and then divided the meat amongst themselves. They ate fruits and roots collected from the forest and cooked food with the oil they extracted from the seeds of the sal and the mahua. Sal and mahua are a type of trees. 
these guys used many forest products for medicinal purposes as well not only that they also sold these forest products in the markets to earn some money in fact the local weavers and the leather workers even turned to khons when they needed supplies of a special type of flowers to color their clothes and leather what about the forest people who survived on rice grains how did they manage to get their supplies of rice grains now at times they exchanged goods <laughs> that is they got what they needed in return for the valuable forest produce the rest of them bought the goods that is bought the goods with the meager amount of income that they had some of them did odd jobs in villages like uh, carrying heavy loads or uh, building roads some of them even labored in the fields of peasants and farmers but when the supplies of forest produce shrank the tribal people had to increasingly wander around in the search for work now but many of them like the baigas of central india were reluctant to do work for others they had a certain pride in them in fact the baigas saw themselves as people of the forest who could only live on the forest produce and it was below the dignity of a baiga to become a laborer another problem that these tribal groups faced that they often needed to buy and sell in order to be able to get the goods they that uh, were not produced within the locality now this led to their dependence on money lenders now traders came around with the things for sale and sold the goods at high prices money lenders gave loans with which the tribals met their cash needs adding to what they earned but the problem was that the interest charged on the loans was usually very high so for the tribals market and commerce often meant debt and poverty they therefore came to see the money lender and the trader as evil outsiders and the cause of their misery the third kind of tribal activity that we'll see is herding animals now many tribal groups live by herding and rearing animals and they moved with their herds of cattle or sheep according to the seasons now when the grass in one place was exhausted they moved to another area example of these kind of uh, tribes who were cattle herders uh, are the van gujjars of the punjab hills or the labadis of andhra pradesh goat herders bakarwals of kashmir now the fourth type of tribals took to settled cultivation now even before the 19th century many of uh, within the tribal groups had begun settling down and cultivating their fields in one place year after year instead of the shifting cultivation that we saw in the first half they actually settled in one place they used to plow the land and gradually they got the rights over the land they lived on now who did this land belong to in the case of uh, certain tribes like the mundas of chota nagpur the land belonged to the clan as a whole all members of the clan all members were regarded as descendants of the original settlers therefore all of them were given rights on the land but very often uh, some people within the clan acquired more power than the others some became chiefs others followers powerful men often rented out their land instead of cultivating it themselves so far we saw the introduction to the tribal life in those times in our next video we'll see how the colonial rule affected the tribal lives